For Will? Will is, of course, a writer for the Mormon Worker. He's very active uh, in all those sort of pursuits. And he's also been a very active member in the RSU, uh, speaking uh, and getting recognition from other uh, social organizations on Palestine, and has been a big draw and influence here in the RSU. So if we could put his hands together for him, uh, that'd be great, and uh, we'll anticipate something good. Probably is good to clap before that way. <laughs> it's not a very good talk, but you're not obligated to clap after, and I won't, you know, know how bad it was. But um, uh, again, I'm going to talk today about Mormonism, socialist heritage, is kind of the title that I gave for the talk. And um, again, for people in this room, well, I don't know what people in this room might think per se, but um, typically around the country, obviously, uh, nobody thinks about Mormonism and socialism in the same. Uh, you know, in the same breath, we think of most Mormons being uh, very uh, capitalist, um, pro-government, pro-war, which is by and large accurate, at least here in the United States. Mormons in other countries aren't that way. But in the United States, that's probably a pretty accurate stereotype. But um, I remember growing up, uh, you know, just going to church every week and occasionally reading the scriptures. Not that I read them too much, not more than any other just kid, I guess. And you'd always read these things in there that, you know, seemed very, very different from the ideas that you get growing up in school. And that kind of um, became more acute when I was at BYU taking just like an economic, like a freshman economics class, and you're getting this free market capitalism uh, rammed down your throat. And it just seemed really different from what certain things I had read, you know, just in the scriptures. Um, and, but since I had never heard of any Mormons actually advocating socialism, I, I was just like, I didn't really know what to make of it. Why are there these things in, you know, the scriptures and then very, very different things that you're hearing from, you know, uh, church leaders or other, you know, prominent Mormons or people at BYU, et cetera. And so it was just kind of strange. And anyways, eventually over the years, um, as I've just found here and there more and more uh, literature, I'm kind of discovering that there really is a socialist heritage in Mormonism, and it's still obviously uh, drowned out um, by the voices like um, Ezra Taft Benson or Glenn Beck and these people that um, are very, very anti-socialist. Um, but nevertheless, that heritage is there even if, you know, for the most part it's been lost. So one thing we're trying to do with the Mormon worker, which uh, is an anti-war socialist Mormon newspaper is try to um, you know revive some of these um, uh, old school Mormon ideas um, about communal economics and about um, pacifism, anti-militarism, and things like that that again are all over in the scriptures, but that contemporary Mormons don't seem to uh, or, or definitely don't advocate much because. Um, Mormons as a whole are largely influenced by American culture um, and internalize, you know, the, the basic bourgeois values that, you know, we, we pick up just living here in the United States. So, uh, at any rate, to, to, to start off, I wanted to talk really quickly about just some of the doctrinal um, foundations. I'll keep that kind of quick and then um, turn more to just some really concrete examples of actual Mormons who were active in different socialist movements. There's examples of communists. Um, a Trotskyist, an anarchist. Um, I personally advocate libertarian socialism or anarchism. So the examples I give here don't all conform with what my view of, of socialism should be necessarily. But again, the idea is just to indicate that hey, there is um, a lot of reason for Mormons to be attracted to and participate in socialist movements because of the doctrine that we have in the scriptures. And these examples of the people I'm going to talk about um, you know, just are, again, concrete examples of that. So um, I guess uh, starting out, um, just to read a, a quick comment from an economics textbook, this talks about how, uh, what's called the marginal productivity theory of income distribution. And it talks about how income gets distributed according to the contribution to society's output. And it can kind of be summed up in the same, to each according to what he or she creates. So that's kind of the foundation of the capitalist idea of who deserves to get what, which is if you create something, 
through your entrepreneurial ability um, and you're being productive then and you have the power to keep whatever um, wealth that you have then that's the wealth that you deserve and if you can't be productive and make much money or any money then basically tough luck you deserve to um, you know starve in the streets type of a thing and um, in uh, the Book of Mormon there is um, a pretty um, pretty great scripture that um, just basically preaches the exact opposite thing and this is a, a, pre or a, a, a sermon given by a man named King Benjamin where he is advocating that people give their substance to the poor and this is what he says he says ye will not suffer that the beggar putteth up his petition to you in vain and turn him out to perish Perhaps thou shalt say, The man has brought upon himself his misery, therefore I will stay my hand, and I will not give unto him of my food, nor impart unto him of my substance, that he may not suffer, that he may not suffer, for his punishments are just. So again, just the idea that if someone's poor and starving, well that's his fault and it's not my fault. I made my money and you know, that guy can, you know, go to hell basically. And in this um, Lecture, King Benjamin basically says the people who take that attitude that, hey, I'm just going to ignore this poor person or this person who is in need, uh, King Benjamin basically says that people like that have no interest in the kingdom of God, is what he says. And that goes along with the type of things that Jesus himself said in Matthew 25, where, um, you know, there's this vision of the last day when um, someone dies and is, you know, kind of going to heaven and ends up meeting um, Jesus. And Jesus says to him, um, you know, welcome uh, to heaven, basically, because you fed me, you visited me while I was in prison, you clothed me, you visited me while I was sick, and then the person says, well, Lord, when did we ever do that to you? And Jesus says, well, anytime, excuse me, anytime you do that to anybody, um, and you're helping anybody in those ways, you're helping me, and so, you know, welcome again into the kingdom of heaven. So that is kind of the basis of Christianity and of Mormonism, in my view, is um, helping other people. And um, so, again, that's what we get from that scripture. Then, what's a concrete manifestation of that? Well, in the Book of Mormon, um, we also have a scripture in 4th Nephi. And this talks about um, the time in the Book of Mormon um, after Jesus' resurrection, where, according to us at least, um, you know, Jesus died and was resurrected. Uh, or died in Jerusalem, was crucified, then he was resurrected, and after his resurrection, he came back and visited um, the people in the Americas. And after he visits the people in the Americas, they, well, this is a comment from Brigham Young, actually, that's quoted in this book, where Brigham Young says, There shall be no private ownership of the streams that come out of the canyons, nor the timber that grows on the hills. These belong to the people, all the people. And Leonard J. Arrington says that that same principle was applied to the mineral resources as well. And again, further in regards to the water system, um, Arrington says, When Utah became a territory, this system of public ownership was confirmed by the legislature and placed under the legal supervision of the county courts. Um, he says, Even today, farmer-owned mutual companies control virtually all the irrigation canals and warming communities in the West. Um, the vast majority of Utah's canals were, quote, uh, built by the farmers, owned by the farmers, and operated by the farmers. In fact, they constitute one of the greatest and most successful community or cooperative undertakings in the history of America, according to that author, at least. Um, another example was how land was distributed when new immigrants came. Um, they were simply given a plot of land and it wasn't allowed for one person to own or control more land than they could actually use um, you know, to support themselves. And this is something that Brigham Young said to a group of immigrants when they arrived in, in the Salt Lake Valley. Um, and this is kind of interesting because these days, you know, when someone doesn't have a lot of money in American society, we really look down on them. And obviously that's different when you're a socialist, where if someone's working class or poor, or from a liberation theology perspective, if someone is poor, those are the type of people that we should actually look up to and, and revere more than someone who is rich. But again, these days it's the opposite. And so when these immigrants were coming, they were totally poor and destitute. And so again, instead of having these immigrants come to Salt Lake Valley and just looking down on them, 
instead the Mormons would have these big parades and celebrations every time a group of new, totally destitute poor immigrants would reach the valley. And after one of these parades that they had for these immigrants coming, this is what Brigham Young said, he said, uh, again with regard to labor, don't imagine unto yourselves that you are going to get rich by it. As for the poor, there are none here, neither are there any who may be called rich, but all obtain the essentials of life. So again, that just gives an idea of, of how things worked in, in, early, um, in early Utah. Um, moving on to some more concrete examples, um, there's um, uh, a story about one of the very first converts to the church in France. His, late, his name was uh, Louis Bertrand. I don't speak any French, so I'm sure I just murdered that. But um, in English, it would be like Bertrand, B-E-R-T-R-A-N-D, in case anyone wanted to look his name up, uh, Louis Bertrand. And um, he was a pretty interesting figure. Um, he lived in France in um, the early, early to mid-1800s. And that was a time when there was a monarchy in France. And this guy, Louis Bertrand, he traveled all over the world um, for several years. He lived in the United States for about seven years. And then shortly before the revolution in 1848 in France, which overthrew the monarchy, he returned to Paris and began studying and became um, active in revolutionary socialist movements. And he was um, uh, an Icarian or a socialist who followed a fellow named Etienne Cabet. And he participated in the 1848 revolution to overthrow the monarchy. He was thrown in prison for about three months because of his political views. Um, and he became the editor of, the, of a socialist newspaper called La Populaire. Um, it had about 200,000 readers at the time in France, and they were a pretty significant political movement. And he was the editor of the paper. And um, he ended up getting converted uh, to the church in um, just a little bit later, I believe it was in 1850. Um, he was baptized by John Taylor, who was a Mormon apostle who would travel to France to help you know, preach the gospel there. And um, uh, just about nine months after Bertrand was baptized, he was actually fired from his job at the, at the, at the newspaper. And so one of the local, one of the missionaries that had come from Utah to France um, hired him to help translate the Book of Mormon. So he is responsible for the vast majority of the, trans the French translation of the Book of Mormon that we have today. And then in addition, there was a friend of his that also worked at the socialist newspaper um, named Isidore Belanger, which is kind of spelled like Bellinger. And um, he also was converted uh, to the church. And because the political situation was really, really bad, in fact, just a few years after 1848, Napoleon III um, ended up uh, taking control of the government through a coup. And the political situation was really tough for socialists at the time. They were um, oppressed. A lot were imprisoned and taken off to labor camps and things like that. So as a result, this um, new convert, uh, Belanger, he um, he ended up going back to his hometown to basically serve a mission, which was kind of out in the countryside in France. Um, he had a couple of converts and ended up starting a branch there. And a few years later, um, he had to stop all of his preaching and activities because of the political repression. And he ended up disappearing. And there's one historian um, who speculates that he was um, arrested by the, by the government and taken off to a labor camp. And he was never, never seen or spoken or no one ever found out anything about what happened to him after that. So, um, you know, again, the, the a large part of the fact that there is the church in France today has to do with the fact that there were these two um, socialists who converted and began preaching the gospel. And this guy, Louis Bertrand, again, because of the political situation, he ended up traveling to um, a place called the Island of Jersey, which is just off the coast of France. And because he had been um, a socialist for such a long time, he had a lot of friends there because a lot of French political exiles had gone to the Isle of Jersey, um, including Victor Hugo, for example, who wrote Les Miserables, who was a prominent uh, revolutionary socialist at the time. And so Bertrand actually preached the gospel to Victor Hugo, and Victor Hugo wrote some poems about Mormons and things like that. So um, Bertrand eventually ended up immigrating to Utah, and he remained a faithful Mormon until the end of his life. He became good friends with Brigham Young, and his grave is in 
Salt Lake City. And my dad actually um, located his grave. Uh, my dad works for BYU TV, and they made a documentary about the history of the church in France, and they managed to locate his grave in Salt Lake. So, um, another example of a of a prominent socialist that was a Mormon is a is a fellow named um, Platino Rhoda Kennedy, and we actually in the brand new issue of the Mormon Worker have an article about him. So I'm just going to give a real brief overview. If you want some more details, you can pick up an issue. Um, also, since it's May Day in that same issue, but just to mention, we have um, there's an autobiography of Albert Parsons, who was one of the um, original Haymarket martyrs um, of Chicago, and um, uh, he was you know, again eventually executed. So there's an autobiography about him in that same issue, and just to, to throw that out as well. So um, this fellow, um, Platina Roto Kanadi, he's actually Greek, and um, in, I believe it was the 1860s, he got word that the Mexican government was giving out free land um, to foreigners, and so he had the idea to try to come to Mexico and basically start up like a socialist school and a commune. And he was a pretty prolific um, uh, anarchist writer. He was friends with uh, Pierre uh, Joseph Proudhon, the famous French, French anarchist. And when he, when he eventually came to Mexico, he started again this um, anarchist school and he supposedly had a dream where um, he was giving a lecture and, or I'm sorry, not where he was giving a lecture, but he had a dream where some random boy came up to him and said, here, take this book. And he was like, no, I don't want it. And the kid's like, no, take this book. You, you know, you really need it. And he's like, no, I don't want it. And then finally he ends up taking the book and that was the end of the dream. So anyways, uh, later on he was giving a lecture and there was like a young guy who came up and actually you know, gave him a Book of Mormon. And he, that kind of what happened in the dream kind of played out where he's like, oh no, that's okay, I'm not really interested. And the kid was like pretty insistent, he's like, no, take it. So he ended up taking that uh, Book of Mormon and became converted to the church. Um, but at that time, the church didn't even exist in Mexico. So this guy, Rhoda Kanadi, ended up establishing his own branches or his own like group of Mormons in Mexico and then had to write the general authorities in Salt Lake to try and have them send some missionaries to Mexico. So it was like a couple of years that he considered himself a Mormon um, before missionaries ever came down. And so when missionaries finally did come down, including um, John Taylor, who was the person who had baptized Louis Bechard in France, um, they ended up uh, baptizing Rhoda Kanadi and a couple other people. Rhoda Kanadi became the very first, first branch president in Mexico. and. Unfortunately, maybe about a year later, um, Rhoda Kanadi became disillusioned with the fact that the church wasn't really moving um, forward with communitarian type economic projects in the way that he wanted. The details about why he, he ended up becoming disillusioned with the church and leaving aren't too clear. There's not too much known about it, but he didn't really stick in the church for, for super long. But again, it's notable that um, a really prominent anarchist from Europe would come across the Book of Mormon and see in that book um, anarchist and socialist ideas that would be totally in um, uh, you know in line with what he believed as an anarchist. Um, the next example um, that I wanted to talk about was uh, Ray Pratt, um, or I guess his full name is Ray Lucero Pratt, which I just mentioned because of Greg in the audience here. Um, and he um, was the grandson of Parley P. Pratt, who was one of the first apostles in the Mormon church. Um, and it's really famous, every Mormon, uh, well not every, I guess, but most Mormons would know a lot about Parley P. Pratt. Uh, he's from that original uh, early period with Joseph Smith, etc. And um, Ray Pratt was the mission president in Mexico um, for about 24 years, um, starting like right about the time that the Mexican Revolution started in 1910. And at the time, obviously, there's a lot of discrimination and feeling in the United States that Mexicans were kind of lesser people, and they're brown skin, they're Indians. Obviously, even today, there's a lot of racism, both here and in Latin America, against indigenous um, people or Indians in Latin America. And Ray Pratt, um, just from you know the years and years that he lived in Mexico, became a real champion of the Indian cause. And he was a supporter of um, Pancho Villa, and of Emiliano Zapata, who were two rebel leaders who had, who, had, um, uh, who had armies that were trying to overthrow the Mexican government. 
um, in a socialist revolution at the time. Of course, Emiliano Zapata, he, the Zapatista is currently in Mexico. Their movement is named after him. And um, so both in Mexico and in Salt Lake, Ray Pratt was you know, giving talks and lectures in support of uh, the Mexican Revolution. He even wrote there's, um, in a PhD dissertation that actually Joe Spencer um, um, keyed me in on. Um, there's poetry of him. He's writing poetry about Pancho Villa, praising him, and so forth. And um, so, again, Ray Pratt is another example of someone who, I don't know if he self-identified as a socialist per se, although on his gravestone, whoever, um, you know, whatever family member of his um, ended up doing, uh, you know, writing what was on his gravestone and talked about, you know, how he was a champion of socialistic ideas. And um, so that, I think, is another good example. Um, let's see how we are for time. One other example I wanted to mention, and this may not be as popular because I know there's a lot of people in the room that hate Trotskyists, um, but uh, I'm going to mention it anyways again, just like I mentioned, because Trotskyism does fit in within the broader, um, you know, the, is, is one of you know the many different uh, socialist movements and um, this fellow's name is Joe Hansen and we actually had an article about him in the newspaper and I just wanted to maybe read um, part of it. This was written actually by my cousin uh, Gregory Van Wagenen and um, who himself was um, kind of a Trotskyist and um, but anyways again it just has interesting links between Mormonism and socialism so let me just read um, parts of this article. It says on the morning of the 20th of August, 1940, Ramon Mercator made his way from Mexico City to the small town of Coyoacan, where he was ushered into the study of Leon Trotsky. He came ostensibly seeking advice from the architect of the, Bol of the Bolshevik Revolution with an article he claimed to have written for the Spanish underground press. History reveals his true motive. Joseph Stalin sent him as an assassin. As Trotsky sat down at his desk to peruse the work, he was attacked from behind. It was a glancing but deadly blow from the point of an ice axe, the type of tool a mountain climber would use to scale a peak. Mercator had hidden the instrument in his attache case. Later, he would describe the scenario as, quote, a wonderful opportunity which I simply couldn't let pass. <laughs> Despite the per perforation of his skull, Trotsky leapt to his feet, spat on Mercator, and knocked him to the floor before falling to his knees. The only other man present was Trotsky's student and personal secretary, Joe Hansen. Hansen tackled the assassin before the death blow could be delivered, shouting for help. While Hansen did manage to save his teacher's life, he certainly prolonged it. Trotsky would die the next evening. Joseph Joe Hansen was born at home in Salt Lake City on June 16, 1910. Joe would be the eldest of the eldest of 15 children to be born uh, to Conrad, a Norwegian immigrant, and his wife, Rose Hansen. Conrad and Rose were sealed in the Salt Lake City Temple in September of 1909, and his father became a U.S. citizen that same year. Um, he goes on to talk about his history a little bit more, um, and eventually, um, Joe, Joe Hansen left home at 17 for Salt Lake City, because he actually ended up being uh, growing up in Richfield, Utah. So when he got a little bit older, or again at the age of 17, he left home for Salt Lake City. He began auditing classes at the University of Utah in 1928, supporting himself with a series of odd jobs when he could find them. With the help of friends on campus, he was able to matriculate the following year. While he only attended part-time, he made a name for himself as the editor of The Pen, a campus literary magazine, and was well regarded as a hard worker by his teachers and peers. Um, he ended up marrying um, Reba Hooper Hansen, who was the granddaughter of the Mormon prophet Heber C. Kimball. And in 1934, Joe and Reba left Utah for San Francisco. Once on the coast, Joe signed on brief briefly to a merchant ship while Reba took odd jobs. His time at port was spent working for the Communist League of America. He served as a staff writer for the Voice of the Federation, which was the newspaper for the Mariners Unions of the Pacific. It was in 1937 that Joe left the United States uh, to join the exiled Bolshevik revolutionary Leon Trotsky in Mexico. Reba remained behind, becoming ever more personally active in politics. Um, after the assassina assassination of his friend and mentor, Joe rejoined his wife in San Francisco. There he enlisted as a merchant mariner, supporting the war against fascism. Um, 
At the end of the conflict, he resumed his work in politics. In 1945, Joe and Reba moved to New York City, where both began working for The Militant, a socialist newspaper which, inspired by Trotsky, was critical of both the capitalist West and the institutionalized bureaucracy of the Soviet Union. That same year, Hansen declared himself a socialist candidate for the New York delegation to the United States Senate. He ran again for the same seat in 1950. From 1950 to 1959, he was editor of the International Socialist Review, the theoretical magazine of the Socialist Workers' Party. In 1960, Joe traveled to Havana with Farrell Dobbs, returning to form the Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Um, among Hansen's contacts during this time were Allen Ginsberg and Norman Myler. Um, it uh, goes on to talk about his work during the, uh, the Civil Rights Movement. It says, the Communist League of America, which had by now changed its name to the Socialist Workers' Party, became increasingly popular with union members and student activists in the 1960s. The party was one of the first to publish speeches by Malcolm X, and the organ of the SWP regularly took interviews from African-American political radicals. In 1963, Joe was in charge of the Socialist Workers' Party delegation to the United Secretariat of the Fourth International in Paris. Um, and anyways, it goes on, he ended up dying in January of 1979. Um, and as far as I know, Joe Hansen wasn't a religious Mormon. I believe he was, you know, became an atheist. Um, but again, I feel like it's useful to include, the, you know, that story because um, he does have a Mormon heritage. And also because one thing that's a little bit unfortunate in the church today is that there is a pretty major divide between um, religious Mormons who are active and people who... Um, end up not becoming active or people who end up deciding that they're you know they don't believe in God and a lot of religious Mormons kind of view those people who grew up in the church but end up leaving as like apostates and there's kind of and again I just think that's a really bad view to take of people who are have a, a, a Mormon background but don't happen to believe in God anymore and I really wish that there was not that judge that judgment of people who just, you know, for various reasons decide they don't believe in God anymore. And so in the Mormon Worker, we um, try to also have not only articles written by and about religious Mormons, but also about um, people that I guess I would term secular Mormons or Mormons who, people who have a Mormon background but don't believe in God anymore aren't necessarily members of the, the actual institution of the church, but still who have an attachment to Mormon ideas and still look back on the things that they learned um, you know, during the time when they were Mormon, again, some of the basic ideas about loving other people and equality and social justice and helping the poor and how those ideas that they got as growing up as Mormons still influence you know, them. So again, I think Joe Hansen is part of the Mormon socialist heritage, as I think kind of the title of the talk indicates. Um, this is the next person I want to talk about. She's maybe the most um, the most fascinating, I think, and I just found out about her like a couple days ago, actually, courtesy of my mom, who <laughs> keyed me in, uh, to this woman. And let me um, just read, same thing, her story is just super fascinating, and so I'm just gonna pretty much read from it. Hopefully, um, it's not too boring for me just to read things, but um, let me just, give you a basic bio about her, and she seems pretty normal from the outset, but once I get into the details, you probably will be a little bit shocked, but um, she, this she writes about herself. I've been a member of the LDS Church for almost 27 years, and I have a sister who was baptized this year. I have nine children, seven are living, I lost two in infancy, and one granddaughter. I have one son who's on a mission in California right now, and two children studying at BYU Hawaii. My oldest son went to BYU. <coughs> Excuse me. My oldest son went to BYU and met his wife there. They're now living in Midvale, Utah. The rest of my children are still living at home. So from that basic description, it sounds pretty boring. Like there's some lady who lives in Draper on the east side in a big house and is driving an SUV and you know goes to church on Sundays and, and spends the rest of her time you know shopping during the week. But let me get into some details about her life. Um, her name is Maria Consuelo de Maya, and uh, this is what she writes about herself. Although I was born in Mindanao, I was raised in Manila, the capital of the Philippines. Um, 
After I was born, my father went to work for the U.S. Naval Base at Subic Bay, and from there he went to Pakistan and Vietnam as a civilian employee. I grew up Catholic. I studied in an exclusive girls' school and later transferred to a private high school. Afterward, I went to the University of Santo Tomas and studied nursing for three years. I never took it up as a profession because in 1972, and this is where it gets interesting, uh, because in 1972, I got involved with a movement that was fighting against the Marcos dictatorship. And uh, again, those, I'm sure most of you know that Marcos was the dictator in, um, in the Philippines and had a lot of U.S. support, did a lot of terrible things. Um, so she says, I became involved because my cousin, whom I was rooming with, was a leader of the Makibaka. This was a women's organization that was the counterpart to the men's organization opposing Marcos. There were lots of anti-Marcos discussion groups meeting in the schools, and they were particularly interested in recruiting from the College of Nursing so they could staff the movement's medical units. My cousin asked me to help her with a few minor tasks, typing her speeches and proofreading some of their literature. Of course, when you're proofreading, you're also reading. I started thinking, this is really something important, and I started going to meetings with her. I recognized that there were social problems in my country. I saw poverty all around me every day, but I thought, well, that's life. There's nothing you can do about it. As I grew up and went to college and read my cousin's literature, I realized that you can do something about it. I decided that it wouldn't be enough to finish college and go to work, helping my family and myself. You have to help others as well. So I decided to join my cousin in the movement, and I participated in rallies and demonstrations against Marcos. My cousin was blacklisted by the government and had to leave school. She told me, if anything happens, don't worry. We'll get you out of here. Not long afterwards, following a major demonstration, I was blacklisted and jailed too. My father did not visit me in jail, nor did he bail me out for fear of associating with me. He was worried about traveling abroad for his job. The school expelled me, saying it couldn't be responsible for my actions. When I was released, the police followed me everywhere. My cousin contacted me, excuse me, and said the movement would pick me up and take me into the underground. I wound up in a safe house in Manila and that's where I met my husband. We learned that we would both be sent to Angeles City, uh, Papanga, to staff a hospital that was being built by the Communist Party of the Philippines, the CPP. When we reached Angeles, we started buying medicines and supplies for the hospital. We worked with the doctors in the operating room, learning first aid procedures, but at the same time we were providing support for the CPP and its military wing, the New People's Army, or the NPA. Any of their people who were wounded in encounters with the military were sent to us. We treated them for gunshot wounds, many of them serious. Because the government troops use soft nose bullets, that makes a small entry wound but leave a large, nasty exit wound. After a while, my husband was sent to the mountains where more people were being shot. There were also many cases of tuberculosis and other diseases. I was already pregnant with our first child and stayed behind in the city running the hospital. What I didn't know was that one of our patients had been caught by the government and tortured. He told me later that the soldiers broke one of his legs. He finally gave in to the pain and told them where the hospital was located. One afternoon I was alone at the hospital and locked it up to take a nap. Somehow the troops broke in, or the soldiers broke in, and I was awakened by a gun barrel poking me in the face. A man's voice behind the gun shouted, wake up. Ten men in army uniforms surrounded me and I panicked. No sudden movements, they told me. Just stand up and turn around. They were looking for one of our commanders, and I told them, he's not here. Go ahead and look around, but there's no one here but me. When they searched the attic, they found the guns that we were hiding for protection. What's this, they asked me. Well, we have them for protection, I said. Come on, I can't even reach the attic. Often female prisoners were raped or even killed, but for some reason they didn't touch me. I was using the gnome de guerra of a prominent and wealthy person, and they might have thought they would be in trouble if anything happened to me. But I still didn't escape torture. I think everyone had to undergo that. I was beaten with the stock of an M16 rifle. Again, US supply, I'm sure. Uh, they wanted me to tell them where my husband was. While they decided what to do with me, my commander came back to the hospital. He came back because he heard that our former patient had been captured. He wanted to get me out of the hospital, the hospital before the troops got there. When he came in, they grabbed him and started beating both of us. The commander kept shouting, don't touch her. But the more he shouted, the more they beat him. They wanted him to give evidence against me, but he refused. After we were beaten, they took us to the military camp in Angeles, Camp Olivas, for tactical interrogation. 
They asked me questions, and if I didn't give the answer they wanted, they slapped me. I still withheld my real name, so my parents never learned that I had been taken. I finally had to tell the military that I was pregnant with my first baby. They sent me to a hospital to make sure that the beatings hadn't damaged my baby. Luckily, everything was fine. When I got back from the hospital, they kept me in a military barracks with the other female prisoners. We were fed dry fish and rice, which wasn't enough nourishment for a healthy baby. But the people outside brought fresh fruits and vegetables to the prisoners, and thanks to them, my first son was born perfectly healthy. After the birth of my first child, we lived in the prison uh, for another year. I applied for amnesty on the grounds that prison wasn't a healthy place to raise an infant. After a series of conferences, the military agreed to grant me amnesty on the condition that I report in weekly. They wanted to make sure the child was well and I was no longer with the opposition. My husband heard through sources in the underground that I had been released and sent me a note saying he wanted to see our son for the first time. He knew the risk, but he was just too excited about being a father to stay away. Eventually, we managed to set up a meeting. The baby cried the entire time, but my husband was thrilled. He promised to find a way we could all be together again in the underground. One day, he sent word that I should pack my belongings and meet him at a certain time and place. I went there and waited, but he never came. I learned through friends that he had been taken prisoner and was being tortured. Even today, he still feels some pain as a result of his beatings in prison. My husband was held prisoner for eight months. After he was freed, we went to Cebu City, where his family lived. We tried to find work, but no one would hire him because he was a known opponent of the Marcos regime. My husband is quite an artist, and he started giving art lessons and selling his own paintings. Eventually, he had several students, and that's how we got by. It was about this time that we first became acquainted with the LDS Church. My husband's cousin was working for the LDS Church educational system, and he was transferred to Cebu to help establish the seminary program there. He and his wife told us a little about the church. Later, we met the missionaries when they began coming by to meet with my father-in-law. Eventually, my father-in-law lost interest, but the missionaries still came by. They would play with my baby, and I would sit and chat with them. Soon, my husband joined us, and before long, we were listening to the discussions. About a year and a half later, in 1975, we were both baptized. After we were baptized, some people from the guerrilla movement contacted us to see how we felt about becoming involved with the opposition again. We told them, we have two kids now. We still support the goals of the movement, but we'll support them in a way that seems best for us and our children. Um, so anyways, and again, she still to this day is an active member of the church. So. Um, just uh, another example of, you know, again, someone who, whose ideals of socialist ideals of helping other people really meshed pretty well with um, the basic ideals that she learned in the church. So um, I guess I'll uh, kind of leave it at that since we're, we're running late, and maybe if there's just a couple quick, quick questions, that'd be great. Let's give them a hand first. Oh, I'm sorry. What's the name of that big cooperative uh, thing with all the train pipes and stuff? With all the train pipes? Drain pipes? You mentioned in the region that there was a big cooperative effort where all of the... For the like, irrigation? Yeah, was all collectively owned. Um, again, this is in the early days of Utah. It's in here. Let me see where that was. I could even show you afterwards if you want. That'd be great. Um, so... Yeah, a lot of like the utopian socialist elements of uh, of Mormonism, you know, they come from the time of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and, and like the early church. But you know, since then, a lot of the church leaders have you know, really come out really hard and explicitly against communism. Like the leaders of the church, which are people whose words are considered infallible and the word of God, they, you know, have come out very hard against communism. You know, Ezra Taft Benson was a part of the, uh, the John Birch Society and all that. Um, so, is it is it really possible? With the church in its current state, with all that you know, all that history that's been subsequently to Joseph Smith, is it really possible to foster this kind of socialist uh, trend within Mormonism? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, that's what, obviously what we're trying to do with the Mormon Worker, and um, you know, it hasn't been. When I first started doing Mormon Worker stuff, like when I was at BYU, I never met another Mormon who was considered themselves an anarchist. And it wasn't until a couple of years later that I ran into Corey Bushman and Tyler Bushman, who we ended up starting the newspaper with. But since then, uh, obviously the numbers aren't too big, but we seem to find more and more people all the time 
are either explicitly anarchists or have you know broadly leftist ideas and you know again the numbers are small but they seem to be they seem to be growing it's like not an uncommon thing especially among younger people like the older generation they still are for the most part um, influenced by that period of the really harsh anti-communism of President Benson. There are some uh, prominent um, exceptions to that, like Hugh Nibley, um, who never probably overtly said I'm a socialist or jo joined any socialist party, but his ideas were very explicitly socialist. Um, he's one of the most prominent um, scholars of the church. Another example is Warner Woodworth, who is a professor at the BYU Business School right now. Um, who is a longtime socialist who actually did um, some consulting work for the Sandinista government in uh, Nicaragua and for the East German government um, during the communist years on like workers' cooperatives and things like that, since that was his, um, his uh, specialty that he did his sociology PhD on, and he's again still teaching at BYU. So anyway, there's, no, there's just a few exceptions to that, but these days things are slowly changing. And then the other thing to remember is um, you know, just like the example of this woman in the Philippines where it wasn't a problem to be, uh, you know, a, a, an ex-member of a communist movement and be an active member of the church in the Philippines. In other countries, the political views of Mormons are very different than they are here in the United States. Again, because in the U.S., it's not really Mormonism that's guiding people's politics so much. It's these other um, non-religious influences that we all pick up living here in the United States. Um, that tend to influence people's thoughts more. Again, if you look at what Glenn Beck says about politics, I mean, you can't find any Mormonism in it, but he is a Mormon. Um, so anyways, in other countries, the situation is very different, and most people don't have these kind of, um, it might be rotten right-wing ideas in other parts of the church. And there are more Mormons now outside of the United States than there are inside the United States. So as time goes on, the situation should continue to improve. So I think the international church may be one avenue, but it seems to me another is the way you began, right? Is with scriptural texts. If there's one thing that Latter-day Saints will listen to, it, I think it is scripture. And it seems to me that the, the, the task of the Mormon work, I think, is, is noble, but I think it's going to be slow going until it can, it can generate from uh, recognized canonical texts a kind of political theory structured right from the text close readings of, of these kinds of passages you mentioned, but also especially the Doctrine and Covenants that lays out uh, explicit economic principles that are along uh, clearly Marxist lines. I think those can be read carefully and, uh, and taught without having to, in a universal fashion, without having to say, look, this is Marxism. But uh, it, can, it can certainly, I think, make a lot of serious headway among traditional members of the church. I know that's a good point that, again, people do respond to scriptures because they consider them authoritarian. And so um, that's a pretty a pretty good approach to take is just to be like, well, hey, here's the scripture. You've probably read it before, but you've never thought about it in this way. You might have just glossed over it, not really knowing what to make of it because you never heard anyone else articulate uh, a socialist interpretation of it, even though the text itself is clearly socialist. I mean, those texts in the Doctrine and Covenants that are really explicit, you know, things like, it is not given that one man should possess that which is above another, wherefore the world lieth in, lieth in sin. I mean, it's clearly saying that you need a classless society, you can't have these class divisions, but people just, since they've never been exposed to socialist thought, really, they read that scripture and they just, oh, I don't know what to make of it, it's confusing, so they just kind of don't think about it much after that. So, um, you're right, that's uh, probably a good approach to take in. Just a quick response. To it. I, I think that's. I, I think what I what I'm what I'm pointing toward is is close, sustained. Uh, I'll even say inventive, creative, productive readings. Uh, there hasn't been enough work done on texts in Mormon scripture that talk about these things in order to say what kind of a political theory is buried here. What is it just because it sounds vaguely socialist, sure, uh, but it can sound vaguely conservative as well. Um, what is this text doing? What are its presuppositions? How does it, and I think if that kind of serious systematic work were done, it might, it might have some real traction. Yeah, that would be helpful. There's actually um, a fellow here at EVU, um, and actually we have an interview with him, uh, Dennis Potter, also in the new edition of The Mormon Worker, and he actually has done, he's not Mormon anymore, so he's kind of dropped uh, this type of work, but he wrote um, at least one really excellent about 20-page essay 
um, discussing the Book of Mormon from a liberation theology perspective, which is really hopeful. I'm going to ask him to see if he'll let us publish it. So there has been a little bit of that, but yeah, definitely a lot more needed. So. Well, let's give him a hand. We need to move on to the next panel. All right. Jacob, do you want me to yeah. go ahead and uh, yeah.